Okay. Guess what? We're hiring. Oh. Although maybe after this you probably want to kill me rather than get hired by me. All right, so I work for them. We do lots of really cool big experiment stuff, big data. If you like lots of scaling out stuff, come talk to me. Pearl isn't that bad. Okay, <laughs> sure. so today we are talking about security theater and practice of investing time and effort into the pretense of making you secure without actually doing that. Now, there, there are actually probably some very good examples in the world right now of, of uh, security theater. <laughs> uh, but I'm, and if anyone knows the story behind those keys? No. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, they all. If you don't know the story, come ask me afterwards. But what I'm going to be talking about today is the security theater about you guys. Because you guys all think your code is great. You think everything you write is secure. And I'm here to kind of cause a bit of a breakup between you and your illusions. <coughs> and you're probably going... <laughs> Bullshit. My code is secure. Good. This is the first step. <laughs> now, I'm not talking just about PHP. I'm talking about everything we do in, in computers in general. Everything from your personal computer all the way up to the web servers you run, to the products you deal with, and the databases, everything. And you might go, I know OWASP. Who does not know what OWASP is, by the way? OK. The Open Web Application Security Project. They publish a list every year of the 10 <coughs> most common reasons your website gets hacked. And they have great guides on what not to do. Cool. If you follow those guides, great. You're still not secure. <coughs> Um, you're still going to have security problems. And the thing is, security problems are a much broader range of issues than just being hacked. Data loss, financial loss, reputation loss, these are all the kind of things that come out from a security incident. And if you don't think uh, your reputation is a major thing, uh, I would like to introduce you to a little company called DigiNota. <laughs> and being Dutch somewhat, you guys probably know about them. Saying we're secure because our code is secure is a sign of security theater. But you use antivirus. <laughs> Let me introduce you to something called crypting. Crypting is not that new, but it's a way of taking a piece of malware, running it through an obfuscator, and then comparing it to every single antivirus product on the market. And then running it through an obfuscator and comparing it again and again until every single one of them returns a green thumbs up. This pretty much bypasses any kind of heuristic detection or signatures that are currently in use in the market. And it's a little worse than that. These guys are organized. They have websites. You can integrate to their REST API and upload your binary to be obfuscated, and they provide integration with Jenkins. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that WordPress? <laughs> 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 they provide better customer support than some of the companies you're familiar with. And they take Bitcoin. Let's have a look at the guys who are on our side. <laughs> Thank you, Trent. This is besides the fact that uh, Node.js has just released a huge security hole in the core of Node.js. They didn't even bother to secure the Node.js. In fact, just by visiting a website that has specific JavaScript on, they can run anything on your computer without you knowing about it. They can also take every single password in Trend Micro's password manager that gets installed in your computer too. <laughs> so you say, well, I don't use Trend. Cool. Soho. They decided that they weren't going to watch out for buffer overflows. So whenever they scan something for a virus, the malware can take over your computer. This is so bad, in fact, every single disk operation on your computer that has Soho installed will run the scan. I can send you a mail. Your mail client will download it, 
Soho will scan it, and I will have compromised your computer without you having even noticed it. But don't worry, I've compiled a comprehensive list of antivirus software that hasn't had a major vulnerability in the last two years. The fact is, we're actually all bad at security in some way. The users are bad. The release, uh, last year's most popular password lists have been released. It is still the same as the year before, except for one small notification. Welcome is now like number five. <laughs> Star Wars made number 10. That was fantastic too. But the top number one is still one, two, three, four, five, six. How do they know my password? Developers are still bad at security. I, I ran the scan about three days ago. Uh, you guys are still committing your, your keys to GitHub. Uh, well done. It's secure. Even the hackers are bad at security. No way. Shame. So, sorry? Oh, right, right. Uh, author of the Linux in code failed for the third time. Ransomware is still decryptable. Ransomware is where someone uh, gets a virus into your computer, encrypts your entire computer, and then demands you pay a ransom fee. Otherwise, it will, you will never get your data back. Except they don't actually do it. Properly. In fact, I think they're taking advice from this guy who says, SRAN time is not cryptographically secure. SRAN MD5 time. <laughs> well. So I'm, I'm going to take a little sideways step here. And I'm going to talk about uh, a project that I've been involved in since mid-2012. Uh, we had, uh, where I lived in South Africa, there was a small ISP, a hosting company, and they were having problems with vulnerabilities. Uh, their websites of their customers were constantly getting hacked. And they wanted to get some idea of just how bad the situation was. So, we put together a list of the kind of software libraries we were interested in. And we built up this big fingerprint database. And we picked 43 of the, what we considered the most popular amongst what was installed. Um, and we started fingerprinting all of the software. And up to about now, we've fingerprinted 4,800 different versions uh, and about an, over 10 million files. And so every month, we'd run these scans over what was on these hosting servers. Uh, once we'd identified what was on the website, we would identify what version it was, and then we would cross-index it with any known vulnerabilities for this. So we get an idea of how many websites were vulnerable and how many were absolutely fine. Uh, in total, we processed that many, about 6,000 per month, from 2012 June till now. It's still ongoing, although in a slightly diminished capacity at the moment. Uh, and we did things like finding out what software has been run, whether they were being updated over time or not, uh, what versions were the most popular, and just how bad shit is. <laughs> so, the results I'm going to be looking at is the results from July 2015, mainly because the results of that are less substantial. One of the servers was taken out of the pool. Uh, the company redid some other servers. They didn't properly instantiate. So, that's the best set of data I have, most recent data. All right. So, Let's look at what was the most popular piece of software that was installed in your average hosting environment. Well, at least I hope it's the most average. What do you guys think it was? WordPress? WordPress? I hear WordPress. No? No? <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, uh, I only worked on mainly open source applications and the most popular ones, surprisingly, not much Java there. Uh, oh, uh, Java, sorry? Apache. <laughs> one, one Apache install, 500 something else, yeah, on top of that, yeah. All right, I'm, I'm gonna give you, <laughs> I'm gonna give you a clue, I'm gonna show you what it wasn't. Okay. Joomla, WordPress, Virtumart, PrestaShop, Smarty, Drupal. 
No. Salesforce. The, the most popular piece of software or library was? TinyMCE. Yeah. Which makes sense, because WordPress uses TinyMCE, as do a bunch of the other ones further down. But why is this important? It means whenever a vulnerability comes out for TinyMCE, every single other application that uses it could potentially be vulnerable as well. No, no, never. <laughs> uh, only five times never. Yeah, no, no. So let's look at the slightly scarier stuff now. We've seen how, what's the most popular one. How bad were the vulnerabilities? How bad do you think it was? Bad. <laughs> okay. Working through the numbers for July, 6,440 websites were scanned. Of that, only 1,082 of them had something that we could identify from that list of most popular ones which means the other ones were either using something we didn't know about, something custom written, or were just static websites. On those 1,082, we found 2,324 different somethings, libraries, applications, packages, whatever. Of those 1,549 installs, Oh, sorry, of those, 1,549 were vulnerable, which meant 626 of the 1,082 websites was vulnerable. And as you can see, not a little bit vulnerable, very vulnerable. Almost 60% of all the websites we looked at had a vulnerability in them. On average. Be aware, this is 2015. We've been doing this since 2012. We'd have been informing the customers since the end of 2012, they were vulnerable. This is the improvement. <laughs> so let's see the breakdown in, in actual bigger numbers. CMSs. CMSs are generally the culprit. So we now know who is the biggest culprit here. The green is Joomla. The purple is WordPress. Drupal is kind of sneaking in the bottom here, and then other. I point out that uh, WordPress has an automatic update feature. So these guys are just not even trying. But the fact that there is an automatic up update feature means there are people who care. <coughs> Less statistically significant, but also interesting, these were the frameworks. Come on, Zand. <laughs> So why is it so bad? Why is it so horribly, 60% is shit? Although I was hoping more for like the 90% of everything is shit. Because it comes down to just a matter of time. The average application or library version, the median time for it to go from being released to being a vulnerability being discovered was 20 months which meant in 20 months, 50% of every single release would be vulnerable. Although to be fair, we have this huge spike here, so we could say within the first four months, a quarter of every single release is vulnerable. But that's fine, as long as the average age of the software is less than 20 months, we're fine. <laughs> Oops. It's more like uh, 27 on general. Although here, very nice to see, these are our updaters. These are the people who use the WordPress update or new websites, actually. So the kind of you get the new websites in here, and they secure for a while, and then it's all to shit. These three spikes, though, were quite interesting, because these were all when the company did specials on hosting, and a bunch of people signed up. And they deployed, and then they fucked off. But this is good. Let me show you what it was two years before that. <laughs> now you can just see all this kind of long tail rubbish down this side. So it's literally people don't update. That is one of the biggest vulnerabilities we have in our system is people don't update. Hmm. <laughs> During this experience, I suffered. 
I have seen things. What the fuck is that? <laughs> I have no idea how to figure out whether a vulnerability release falls below that or above that. How do I order that? <laughs> this actually wasn't the worst. The worst was one small plugin that was very popular, where the guy would update it 12 or 13 times before he changed the version number. So a vulnerability would come out, he'd patch it, he'd commit it, but the version number would be the same. The things we had to do to fix it, I will not describe here. OpenX had a backdoor for over a year. From, what is it? Two November 2012 to August 2013, OpenX had a giant backdoor installed in it. Deliberately. Interestingly enough, in about August 2013, they were bought out by another company and changed their name to revive that server. So if anyone asks you to install something like that, be aware. But they also renamed from Open Ad to Open X. Somewhere Before that, I think it was PHP ads yep. to Open Ads to Open X to revive that server. Yes. All kind of managed security issues. But nothing beats the next one. This is a scan result in July 2015. Joomla is now on 3.5. Someone doesn't understand that when you update, you remove the old version. You don't put it in a folder called backup, or backup backup, or backup <laughs> old backup backup on a live web server. But that's also not as bad as the fact that Joomla 1.5 had so much copy-paste code that it kept mistaking the administrator folder for the root of Joomla. Okay. Let's take some learning from this. What I learned. Projects with bad versioning had the worst security issues. If you had an automatic patcher, people used it. If they couldn't update the version because your plugins or templates would break horribly, no one updated ever. Even after telling them for over two years that they were running a vulnerable version and listing all the vulnerabilities, and of course them being hacked, they still never updated. And finally, patch fatigue exists. We tell people that what they're running is vulnerable. They patch it. We tell them three months later, when another vulnerability comes out for the one they just patched to, they patch it. You tell them two, week, two, uh, two months later that it's vulnerable again, and they're like, fuck this shit. <laughs> We've had enough. No more. So it was great for a while, and then everyone just gave up. Cool. Back to the original story. Anger. Why doesn't someone do something about it? Well, strange thing happens. When you tell people they have something vulnerable, they don't thank you. They set their lawyers on you. Because a lot of companies still believe that if no one knows about it, it's fine. Now, some tech companies now have bounties on bugs, which is great, but that's kind of the exception rather than the rule. I myself, because I was required to integrate payment gateways, pointed out a couple of interesting holes in a payment gateway. And they said very politely in an email to me that if I should ever bring it to the attention of anyone, they would sue me. Does this hold true? Do that? I can't say anything, because they might sue me. Really? Strangely enough, we still ended up integrating with them. Because it wasn't my choice, it was a decision handed down to me. The thing is, I can't afford to go to court <laughs> and pay for a lawyer to defend me. It's not whether they're going to win or not. It's just the time you're going to spend on doing that. And then it also depends on which country yeah. you're in and what laws apply. So if you can get your legal fees back if you're proven okay. Uh, but that's the thing. It's not going to engender anyone to ever tell you there's a giant problem with your system to fix it if everyone keeps threatening. Uh, right. Also, they're not doing such a great job themselves. 
All right, all right, right, right. Well, that, don't we have some kind of standards we can hold to? You know, we should get down, write a standard and say, right, this is the ideal of security. And then we can get insurance companies to say, if you don't follow this, we won't insure you and everything will be hunky-dory. Wow. <laughs> we do. <laughs> and they're really hard to access. If you, if you want access to this one, that's 650 euros to read it. If you want to get certified in it, it's 50,000 euros. And that's just for this one. This one obviously doesn't, doesn't cover credit cards. If you want credit cards, you need to learn that one. And they, mm, if you want to work with the uh, US government, you need to know that one. Why doesn't government do just something about it? I cannot actually think of a worse group of people to do something about it. <laughs> they haven't got their own shit together. And quite honestly, they're causing enough shit. And when they're not causing shit, they're busy hacking you themselves. One small ray of light, though. We are starting to see some meaningful change around data security breach notifications. So when they get compromised, they're actually now supposed to tell you in certain places, So which is great. So now you know you've been fucked. All right. Next stage, bargaining. But what if we install cool, sophisticated, advanced systems to keep us safe, you say? All right, all right, well, maybe we could go to someone like the lead in network security like Juniper and get them to install some sophisticated <laughs> software and hardware to keep us safe. <laughs> they only found out about one of the back doors when the NSA told them. The NSA only told them because they had installed, we're pretty sure, the other one and was fed up with the Chinese using the other backdoor. <laughs> <laughs> and quite honestly, IDSs, in my experience, and other people's experiences, tend to cause more noise than actually solve the problem. You spend up more time tweaking the rules to the point where they're ineffective because someone in some remote office keeps triggering everything because they have something ungodly installed in their machine and then you have to wake up at 2 in the morning and you just go, fuck it, off. But they do create nice reports, and managers like reports. Maybe we could start following some of these cool ISO standards, and, and uh, you know, that will fix our solution. I mean, fix our problem. Yeah, that's great for your insurance premiums. In fact, most of these ISO standards are about checkboxes to get, you know, uh, to deal with things like in industry standards or government regulations, or it's a requirement from the insurance company. You won't get insurance otherwise. But they're not really going to help you that much. Remember, these are the uh, people who still keep asking you to create a password eight characters long with one number and one capital letter. And no funny digits. <sighs> wow, shit. Take this to heart, and everything will be OK. <laughs> but cool, we've now got to some kind of level of acceptance now. Which is good, because now that we've acknowledged there is a problem, we can start to do something about it. We need to realize the effectiveness of what we're doing is not, <laughs> it, it just does not work. Most of our security practices are ineffective, because we do them in isolation. But security is not something you do in isolation. Security is a holistic thing. You need to do it as a whole. Now, excuse the incredibly terrible artwork, but this is, as developers, tends to be the area we have our influences over. But there's a hell of a lot of other things here. You need to make connections with all these others if you're going to do security right. Doing it at this level is not going to be sufficient. You need to deal with the humans using your systems. These are the people you need to talk to. You need to make sure all of this is up to scratch. System administrators. And then there's kind of this area which gets murky because you have very little control over them and then the internet's full of eels. Security is about layering. If someone gets through one of your defenses, he shouldn't have free reign. He should come up against another wall, preferably with archers, pissed off. 
security is about attack surface. If you can reduce the areas you can be attacked on, you can focus your resources there. Security is about alertness. If you do not know what's going on inside your system, how can you see when something odd happens? Because it's more likely some system administrator or database administrator is going to contact you and say, one of our databases is doing way too much work. Fix your queries. And you'll look at it and you'll see someone's doing a, a database dump and then shipping it off to China. Security is about mitigation. When a compromise happens, not if, when it happens, you need to make sure that where it happens is isolated enough that only what's in that domain is affected. If a hacker gets in and they suddenly have access to everything, then it's over. And finally, security is about trust. Wait, what? Trust? Isn't this whole thing about we can't trust anyone? Everything we do in security is about trust. Be aware of what you are trusting though. The hardest part of security you're writing is not writing secure code, it's realizing where you've misplaced your trust. Trust is a chain. I trust that my computer is not compromised. How do I know that? It's up to date and is running antivirus that is trustworthy, i.e. <laughs> Linux. I trust that the software that I'm using doesn't have any vulnerabilities. And how do I know that? Vulnerability researchers, security updates. I trust that the software is configured properly. Preferably via automated provisioning, because if you're setting up all your servers by hand, it's very easy to make a mistake, and then you have to change everything. And I trust that the network is configured properly and secure. Hire yourself a damn good system administrator. I trust that you are who you say you are. When we're talking online, and I'm busy visiting your website, I need to know that I'm talking to you, not him. Don't trust him. You. <laughs> <laughs> How do we do that? TLS certificate peer verification or logging onto the website so you know who I am. Every single computer, every single device tends to come with a pre-installed list of certificates of who we trust. Well, the people who make the operating system all the devices trust. And you trust them. Microsoft can install new certificates by themselves. Uh, I think Kazakhstan now requires every citizen to install their own custom root certificate because if a certificate, a root certificate on there signs a, a certificate for any website, you don't know if it really is the website you're going to. You have to trust that root certificate. Anyone here? Are we going to yeah, talk about Lenovo? No, 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 I would just ask who is really checking the SSL certificates and check who is signing them off. That's the thing. Uh, DigiNoto was a Dutch company that issued SSL certificates. They were compromised. Someone stole their root certificate. Within a month, they were bankrupt because if you cannot trust that root certificate, you have to revoke it, which means everyone who ever was issued a certificate by them, gone. They have to get new certificates. So that's sort of what you're paying with those expensive, expensive fees whenever you buy a new SSL certificate is the promise that they won't lose that primary root certificate. <laughs> or, or use something like Let's Encrypt. Mm, excuse me. I trust that you are allowed to, to talk to me about what we're talking about, which is different from authentication. Authentication is I am me. Authorization is I am allowed to do this. So can we talk about my financial records? I trust that what you're sending me hasn't been tampered with. We can do that with hashes. Maybe you send you a file and you check the hashes, make sure it hasn't been modified, or signatures, or encrypted communication has that built in. I trust that what we're talking about is between us. No one else can eavesdrop in, in our conversation. I'm talking to you, he just hears gibberish. That's your public private keys, SSL encryption. I trust that your computer is not compromised. You have absolutely no control over that. You have to trust that he hasn't been going to very interesting domains and installed something viewers and uh, is busy uploading everything on his hard drive to some remote site in Russia. I trust that what we talk about, you're not gonna share with someone else. 
And that's also who doesn't really have a technical solution to because the best we have are contracts or maybe you know, the legal legalities of sharing that information or maybe a terms of use. But uh, terms of use, if you've seen any of them Facebook-wise, what you say, Facebook goes, yeah, sure, tell me about your new baby. I won't share it with anyone. By the way, would you like to buy this brand new stroller pram? <laughs> I trust that the user using the software won't be the so weak link. And they can be the weak link because they don't know how to use the system or they're intentionally trying to do something malicious. But there are ways to make this chain stronger. Things like two-factor authentication. You have a password. You lose that password, the link breaks. The chain is compromised. If you have two-factor authentication, now you have two links. Both of them need to be compromised for the chain to break. Implementing double checks. If you're dealing with a high-risk system where money is involved, transferring larger amounts of money between different accounts, paying third parties, if you have a second person having to sign off on each payment, that's a double check. It means if one person tries to do something malicious, the other person will catch it, hopefully. Signatures on a message, just to see the message hasn't been modified. Encoding HTML output that you get from the database, because you don't know who put that in. Anywhere you make an assumption, if you can find out and prove that assumption, rather try and prove the assumption, then make it. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some of the common mistakes we make coding-wise, because otherwise it would be a very boring talk with lots of slides about you know, soft, huggy, feely, squishy things. The things we make mistakes around cause weakenings. The easiest way to compromise encryption or hashing is to reduce the time it takes to attack it. And you can do this unintentionally yourself, or someone else can try and do it to you. Normally it's done through bad implementations. This also is probably in the wrong place. But this is also kind of important. We don't know what we don't know. A lot of the stuff about security is stuff that we, as normal developers, don't read up on often. So that is actually something you need to deal with yourself. You need to find out, based on the software you're running, the dependencies you have, and the industry you work in, what is happening. Sign up for mailing lists, uh, CVE, uh, RSS feeds. Uh, read up on what's happening, because that's going to keep you way ahead of just hoping your code is secure. So, authentication. Authentication, two-factor authentication, there you go. That's pretty much the easiest thing I can, I can give you. Install that, it works. Instantly, you don't have uh, this, this weak link on login. Or even better, OAuth. OAuth means you don't even have to store the information about the customer. Because it means if you store the information, you are now responsible for it. You need to deal with the legalese of having that information. In the EU, where they have the right to be forgotten, you need to know how to clear that information. If you ever lose that information, you need to inform people you've lost that information. Let someone else deal with it. What if you're the one having the IDP? Having the? The IDP server. So the, the server for the OAuth. Well, <laughs> then it's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> Encryption. This is very important. <laughs> if you're rolling your own, you're doing it wrong. We've got very, very smart people working on this already. And even they make mistakes. Avoid old tutorials on encryption. There are plenty out there. In fact, avoid old tutorials in general because they tend to tell you old stuff from old versions of whatever you're working on. If you want to know what is currently considered the prime, this is what you use with encryption, have a look there. This is kept up to date with up to the minute what is uh, the best encryption to use, how do you handle signatures, uh, what's considered the best random number generator, and so forth. Avoid advice like this. Oh, my thing's returning this error. I don't know, just turn off peer verification. <laughs> You're weakening security for convenience. These are all over Stack Overflow. Do not follow this advice. If anyone says, I've got a problem. The advice to give him is not turn off the security features to make it work. Thankfully, 
Daniel Lowry to the rescue, he's now sorted this from PHP 5.6 onwards, just handles it for you. You don't have to turn shit off. Although if you do have turned that off, go and remove from your code and update to 5.6. Hashing, hashing's a great one. I'm gonna tell you nothing about salting, except One way encoding, taking something big, turning it into a predefined size so you can compare it to other ones for like passwords, or for integrity checks to make sure a file hasn't been modified in transit. Weak hash functions are a thing. Keep up to date on what is currently weak because it's very easy to create big rainbow tables now. I mean, you can create a list of every single combination of passwords up to 12 characters and it's only gonna take up 690 gigabytes of space. And they'll be able to look up anything in that in a couple of seconds. Avoid weak functions, weak hash functions. It's not just what crypting algorithms we use, it's how we use them. Can anyone tell me the difference between this one and this one? By the way, they both return true or false correctly. Can you guys read it at the back? The first one updated space and then the second one. The first one has one issue, it's based on mscript. And mscript is like totally not. But this, this call here is the one that is in IRC Maxwell's uh, op compat, password compat to this. this. This actually does work correctly. It does, it just outdated. mscript is. They will both return true or false in absolutely correct ways, but they are the first one is vulnerable to something. Timing attack. <coughs> That's brute forcing cryptographical functions by working out how long it takes to execute them. Here's an example of what. I've got three strings here. Comparing these two means it has to compare A, B, C, and only on the fourth one will it fail. That's how long it takes to execute. However, comparing one and three, one, two, it'll fail on the second one. You run that enough times against someone's website. Here's my username, here's my password. A thousand times, see how long it takes on average to execute, change the password slightly, do it again. As the hash keys values change, the time will change. As you get closer to matching it, uh, as you get closer to matching it, the time will take longer. You can work brute force someone's hash just by iterating over it enough times and recording how long it takes. You can do this with, with usernames too. If you want to figure out if a username exists, run it on a username you know, but without a uh, correct password, then run it on a username you don't know. If the times are similar, then that username probably exists. If it ex exits a lot faster, then the username probably doesn't exist. Sessions, sessions are also a fun one. If you make a mistake with sessions, all of your password checks don't matter. People can bypass the entire thing. Also, and you might be noticing a trend here, don't roll your own. This was a security vulnerability in PHP My Admin. Can anyone see what the problem was? This was for clearing out uh, a session. Here's the thing, unless you know the intricacies of every single one of these functions, you won't necessarily spot it. What happens here is you pass in a query string and you say unset the session. So as an administrator, you can decide kill all these sessions. Or as your own user, you can say kill my own session. This function here, pass string, unpacks this into the global, into the namespace. So anything that's something equals something and something equals something will unpack it as that variable equals something which means you can override session. And you see right here, they close, write close session, which takes what the session currently is, stores it, goes do some other stuff, and then you can bring the session back. So in effect, this allowed anyone the ability to override the session, and the session stored something and said, authenticated, yeah. So this is the stuff we don't know that we don't know until it is a vulnerability. I mean, most of the vulnerabilities you've seen coming out of WordPress at the moment actually are a lot more sophisticated than your average hacks. 
stuff coming out of Joomla is still SQL injections. But WordPress <laughs> hacks actually are quite sophisticated now. Randomness. Don't roll your own. <laughs> Non-deterministic randomness is critical for encryption. Do not roll your own. It's also really hard. This random uh, algorithm was in use for seven years before it was finally outed as a weakened algorithm that was placed there by the NSA, which reduced the amount of time it took to crack someone's password from heat death of the universe down to oh, a day or so. Also, know where your random functions are getting their randomness from. Rand is not secure. These two are. And this one is sort of secure until OpenSQL, uh, OpenSSL is compromised again. Information disclosure. We are also often uh, guilty of this. When you're going to ask a remote server, give me this page. They also send all this other cool stuff with. Like, for instance, the fact that you're running Apache and PHP 5.5.11, which is great, because then I can look up against vulnerability database and go, oh, look, but there's all these holes I can now poke in your system, but because... Course, you won't be doing security by security, you'll be upgrading. Uh -huh. <laughs> so turn this shit off in your yeah, PHP.ino. You yeah. <laughs> or, or you could do that. That's also pretty cool. <laughs> also, a good reason why you should be turning off all your warnings and errors on live. If you don't do this, but strange enough, Google also happily will index all of this if it hits a page somewhere. <laughs> but the, every single bit of, of output that you give could potentially disclose information. Now, you might not think these are that critical, except for the fact you've now given all this information about your path structures, which maybe can't be used right now, but with combined with another problem or vulnerability, can. Social engineering, my favorite requires no hacking whatsoever. We password reset procedures. If I can Google your questions and find the answers, it is not secure. How does your customer support handle resets? Hi, I forgot my password, I can't remember my questions. Okay, sir, we'll just reset it for you. Which email address would you like me to send all these details to? <laughs> customer support training is tough though. You're always doing a convenience versus security trade-off. At some point, some old granny will really mess up. However, she's a very cunning old granny, then maybe she's trying to get into someone's account. This is my favorite story. So the guy who owns this Twitter handle, N, a hacker wanted it. So he went and he realized that this guy had his own domain where his mail was sent to. So he went to GoDaddy and he said, hi GoDaddy, I need to change where my mail is pointed to. And GoDaddy said, mm, I'm afraid we can't do that unless you know the last four digits of your, uh, your credit card. Because he wanted to reset his account. And he went, uh, well, I don't know what that is. I don't know if it's my wife's one or not. Uh, but if you give me the last four digits of my social security number, I can tell if it's my wife's or not. GoDaddy went, yeah, here's the last four digits of your social security number. Oh, yes, that's mine. Let me go and find that card. And he went over to PayPal, the phone PayPal. I said, hi, PayPal. I need to uh, figure out which card is, is on my account. Uh, this is my uh, last four digits of my social security number. And uh, PayPal went, oh, yeah, sure. You got this one. This is the last four digits of your credit card number. Great. Back, <laughs> back to GoDaddy. Hey, GoDaddy. The last four digits of my, I found my card. Can you reset it? Not a problem. Reset. Great. Goes to Twitter, reset password, sends to the domain, uh, to, to the mail account, redirected to the hacker's machine, he picks up the reset mail, resets the account, guy's lost his Twitter handle. What part of your software was vulnerable there? PayPal's software Good wasn't choices. vulnerable. GoDaddy wasn't vulnerable. Well, and, and Twitter wasn't vulnerable. But all of them were bypassed because people give up information. Yeah, but have you seen their practices in keeping you from not moving your domain away? It's worse than Comcast. We've gone through all our stages of grief. 
now we can embrace hope. Since security is this holistic approach, not only do you need to understand the whole picture, you all need to work together. This is not something that one developer can secure. We as a community need to work together to secure. We need to read. We need to new, know about these threats. We need to know what the best practices are. We need to share them with each other and preferably don't share the links to the really bad tutorials. OWASP, AVS, ASVS project, which is actually also co-authored by a Dutch uh, security group, has just come out. Go read on that. I'm going to be reading that too. That's all about application security verification standard. Sounds very, very dull reading. But hopefully that will teach us a little bit more about how to standardize our security approach. Information, only store what we actually need. It doesn't matter what marketing department tells you, they need to store about your customers. Try and minimize the information as much as possible and keep it separate, segregate it as much as possible. Have a patching strategy. If you have a dependency that's preventing you from updating your version of whatever, fix it now. Because otherwise you'll find yourself in three years time running a version of PHP 5.4 and you can't update because some uh, binary dependency in CentOS is holding you back. Don't become comfortable. If you know of a vulnerability or a problem in your system, deal with it. The longer you leave it, the more comfortable you'll have with the fact that you have a giant hole in your system. Training. Have a plan on how to train people to use your system. If you're going to deal with customer management, uh, any kind of password reset, have a plan so when someone asks for it, you don't end up handing over the keys to the castle. Compromise strategy. No one ever wants to plan for one of these, but you should. So when shit goes wrong, have a plan. Write it down. Even if the right, right, all you're writing down is we have no plan at the moment. <laughs> Update it at least once a year. If nothing else, so you can turn around to, uh, you can say to management, look, we have a plan. It currently says no plan. Can we do something about this? Also, a very good idea, make sure you have some kind of disable system. Because when someone compromises your system, they're going to go for the value in it. And everyone's system has some value. We might not think of it as tangible financial value. They might be after something completely unrelated. They might just be using you as a stage to attack someone else. They might be attacking you for your customer's data. They might be attacking it for your payment system. Or they might be attacking it for whatever product you have that they want to leverage. Have some way to turn those off in an emergency. Just a kill switch. Something that can turn off one piece of the system without bringing everything down. The thing that costs you money. That's, that's really what you want to prevent. Oh, and test it. Mistakes will be made. You've got a choice of either learning from those mistakes or patching them over and carrying on. And I've had this as well. We've, I, I've, I've had issues, uh, times when the system I worked on has been compromised. It wasn't my fault, of course. <laughs> but all of a sudden, there is this huge interest from upper management to resolve this problem. And it's great. For about a month, there is all this resources and time and focus on it. And then suddenly, they don't care anymore. And the thing is, unless you can grab those resources and apply something that is long-lasting, you will lose that momentum. Rate limits. If you don't have a rate limit on your system, build a rate limit on your system. Someone will abuse it. This is probably for your own good anyway. Monitor everything. You're more likely to be alerted by a graph that's ticking off some DBA because it keeps sending them messages at 2 in the morning than you are by your IDS. Graph everything. If it moves, graph it. If it doesn't move, graph it in case it does. <laughs> Decouple your roles. If the marketing department really, really, really wants that WordPress site that they promise they'll keep updated, make sure it is as far away from your system that the only way to communicate with it is by a smoke signal. <coughs> make sure that when something gets compromised, it doesn't take everything else down with it. Make sure that the, 
uh, software running on a particular server only has the permissions and accesses that are vitally required for it to do its job. Version properly. Otherwise, I get really, really, really unhappy. <laughs> How hard? Major changes. That break backwards compatibility. Minor changes. Patches. Done. Compose everything. No more excuses. Seriously, guys. No more excuses. That means you can update your stuff. And the best way to do it, as far as I'm concerned, dev master everything. <laughs> if you have some piece of software that uses plugins and templates, if you are a builder of one of these things, make sure they are decoupled. If someone cannot update their CMS because the plugins and templates will break, that require hard coding to fix, you're doing it wrong. We've got Composer. Let them put it in Composer too. Get behind PSR 9 and 10. For those of you who don't know, PSR 9 is the disclosure policy for vulnerabilities in your software. So when you have a vulnerability, this is how it gets treated. This is how you inform people. These are the contact email addresses that people must contact on you when they find something about your software. Number 10 is how to document your, your vulnerabilities in a way that my programs can analyze so I can build cool tools for you guys so you can find out what you're running is vulnerable or not. This is a group performance, guys. Everyone needs to pull into this. Otherwise, we're going to be screwed. Thank you. <laughs>